Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Holy Trinity. Uh, my name's Mike, I'm the vicar here, and today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, just four days until Christmas. Uh, we're nearly there. So uh, let's get ready, let's grab a drink, let's get comfy, and uh, just have a look now at what's coming up this Christmas week at Holy Trinity. <laughs> So welcome back. Let me just uh, give you a, a quick heads up about a few things really just to draw your attention to uh, from what you've just seen. Don't forget that this afternoon is the Holy Trinity Christmas gift. That's going to be a special service of, of readings and poetry and animation and music and clips. Loads of Holy Trinity folk are going to be involved. Four o'clock this afternoon on our YouTube channel um, and we would love to see you uh, for that. On Christmas Day, here at church, uh, there's a service at 10 o'clock, a Holy Communion service. I'm really thrilled that Bishop Jonathan, uh, the Bishop of Huddersfield, will be leading that service. And it would be great if you could come along uh, to that. Our hope is at the end of that service that uh, the, the congregation will be able to go outside and sing some socially distanced carols just to conclude that service uh, on Christmas Day. So if you're able to come along, 10 o'clock here uh, on Christmas morning. And then at 11.30 uh, on Zoom, uh, everyone is welcome and invited to just catch up, to wish one another a happy Christmas, get your Christmas jumper and your Rudolph antlers on, and uh, we'll sing a carol, uh, we'll see what the kids have got for Christmas, and we'll just wish each other a happy Christmas. And then finally, just to say that next Sunday, the 27th, uh, there is one service, it's here at church at 10 o'clock uh, on the 27th and uh, there'll be no online service next week. So if you're able to come along here, it would be great to have you uh, as part of our worship on the 27th. Now let me ask you a random question. What are you eating or what have you eaten for breakfast today? I'm guessing some people have really gone to town and had a fry up, a bacon sandwich, maybe some croissants. Me, I'm a regular kind of toast guy and uh, I wonder just if you like some of the stuff that we have in our house on toast. Uh, you might want to say in the chat what you've had for breakfast today. So uh, here's a big favourite in our family uh, is Nutella. I personally can't stand it but it's a really big, it's a big jar and it's really popular. Do you like Nutella? Maybe some of you have had that today. This is one that's gonna divide opinion. Marmite, I love Marmite on toast. Hot buttered toast with thickly spread Marmite. I love that so much. And then probably the thing that I have every day on toast is marmalade. I'm a, a right Paddington. Uh, marmalade is an absolute must for me. I absolutely love it. What do you love to eat for your breakfast? Why don't you share that with everyone in the chat? as we continue the service. Second question, who do you love today? Who do you love today? Now, let me tell you who I love. And again, feel free just to share in the chat who, you are, who you're feeling the love for uh, this morning. I love my dog, Joey. Take a look at him. How could you not love a dog like that? He is absolutely adorable. 
but I also love my family. I, and, and I love them in a completely different way to my dog. And that's the thing with this word love. We can talk about Marmite and we love Marmite. And I can talk about loving my dog and loving my family. And we use just this one word, this one four letter word. And today what we're gonna do is try and get our head around that word love, particularly when it comes to God's love, God's love for us and our love for him and for one another. And so right now we're going to light our Advent candle, the, the candle of love. So first of all, we lit the candle of peace. Sorry, no, the candle of hope. Then we lit the candle of peace. If I can get it lit. Then we lit the candle of joy. And today, our fourth candle for the fourth Sunday of Advent, the candle of love. And St. John said, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So let's pray together. Loving God, your mercy and compassion endure forever. Open our hearts that we may receive your love today. And following the example of your son, spread that love to a love-starved world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who loved us to the end. Amen. Now let's worship our God, our King, together. to thy glory. 
Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we long for you. Thank you for this season of Advent, of waiting, of preparation. Thank you that soon we will glimpse the Christ child come among us at Christmas. God in the flesh. Help us to be ready to receive you. God's greatest gift of love. And make your love felt amongst us by your spirit this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. So in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul says this. He says, follow God's example. Another translation says, be imitators of God. Follow God's example as dearly loved children. And live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. And I wonder how that's been for us, for you and me this week. How has that imitating Christ, taking him as our example and living like him been? How's that been for you? And I know that I can hold my hands up and in my own life recognise that I have consistently not reflected God's love at time. Uh, and I've not lived like Jesus. So let's just take a, a short moment of quiet. Uh, God is with us by his spirit. Let's allow him to search our hearts. And then we will come to him in confession, knowing that he is slow to anger and rich in love. Let's be quiet for a moment. So we pray together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart and we have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And now may the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal us and strengthen us by his spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's continue to pray. We're going to pray for the needs of, of the world, uh, for the church, and, and Julie will lead us now. Let's pray together. Lord, we respond to your invitation to come to you with all our needs, our requests, our burdens, and in so doing to find rest, to find peace, and to find that your burden is light. As we come to our intercessions, we're so grateful, Lord Jesus, that you are always interceding for us. You are our Emmanuel. You became man and yet now you are the Father, the perfect mediator between man and God, and we're lost without you, Lord. In this season of Advent, we know that in you there is life and love hope, joy and peace, and yet our world is so dark and chaotic at this time, Lord. Russ Parker's poem, A Sonnet for Christmas, reads, Even though that child is born again, Herods go about on killing streaks, stalking the weak on city streets, leaving people shell-shocked with their pain. And we've seen that this past week, Lord, in Nigeria. We pray for that nation, traumatised again by the abduction of hundreds of young people, boys this time, from a school, 330 of whom are still missing. Lord God, despite such darkness in men's hearts, please bring some hope and peace, protection, and resolution as negotiations take place to see boys released 
And Father, it's so easy to forget crises that have occurred in the past. And we lift to you the girls, about a hundred of them still missing from the serious attack of this nature that took place six years ago. We barely know how to identify with people who suffer such atrocities or how to pray. But Jesus of the scars, we know you identify. We know, Lord God, you never sleep, you never slumber. You know all things and you are love. And so we lift them to you, compassionate God. Lord, the global pandemic still rages and the almost global celebration of Christmas is about to happen. So we ask for your help. Help for governments, for medical teams, help for all of us to act with wisdom and with due concern for the welfare of others. Here in the UK, Lord, we seek your intervention in the Brexit negotiations. In these final days, we still call out to you, Sovereign Lord, asking your help to bring about something positive. More pressing still, though, for lots of people are issues around the impact of the past 10 months of lockdowns and restrictions. Father, many may be at the end of their tether, struggling in many different ways. Lord, thank you for your word and for Psalm 142, which says, When I am overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. So, Lord, for any who are overwhelmed, within and without, we ask that you will guide them. Lord, light their way on a path that will lead them to you. Be to them a refuge and a strong tower. For our own church, Lord, we ask your continued guidance that we will also know you lighting the way for us, corporately and individually. We want to be a people following your leading in every way, Lord. And we know that our mission partners seek to do that too. And we ask that you'll richly bless them and the work that they've undertaken. Bring comfort and peace healing and encouragement to any in our church family who are suffering at this time. Lord, we thank you that you hear us and you know the longings of our hearts. And Jesus, as we say together the words you gave us to pray, we thank you again that you came to share our humanity and we rejoice greatly today in all that that means for us. So let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Hello, my name is Jasmine. And my name is Jada. And, and today, today we're, we're going, going to learn learning about love. Oh my gosh, Jasmine, I totally forgot. Let's open our advent calendar. You can go first. Okay. <laughs> so there's some three chocolates and a scripture that says 1 John chapter 4 verses 7 Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God Okay, my right turn some chocolates and a scripture. Don't worry, we're going to be eating those later. <laughs> Romans 5.5 5. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And what do, exactly does that mean? Well, we're going to tell you right now. This represents the Holy Spirit and this represents our hearts. 
and it God it pours His love it into our hearts, and we can share it with the world. So these napkins represent our, our, um, our love from God going into other people's hearts because we share it with others and to the world. Now that we've given our love to these other people and the world, when they let God's love into their life, they will be filled with his love. How about you? So if you've heard of Jesus, you probably know about one of his famous teachings called the Golden Rule. Do to others what you would want them to do to you. And this, actually, is a restatement of something else that Jesus said, that the meaning of life is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that's really beautiful, but what does he mean exactly by the word love? It's an unclear word in English, because you can love your mom and you can love pizza. And if the word love means the same thing in both of those cases, your mom's going to feel real bad. So what did Jesus mean in his language? Well, first of all, this love your neighbor phrase is a quotation from the Hebrew scriptures, where the word for love is ahava. However, the language Jesus spoke and taught in from day to day it was a cousin language of Hebrew, that is Aramaic, in which the word for love is rachma. But then, as Jesus' followers spread his teachings around the world, they translated them into Greek using the word agape. But here's what's fascinating. The earliest followers of Jesus who wrote the books of the New Testament in Greek, they didn't learn the meaning of agape by looking it up in ancient dictionaries. Rather, they looked to the teachings of Jesus and the story of his life to redefine their very concept of love. So one time, Jesus was asked about the most important command in the Jewish scriptures. And he first quoted from the ancient prayer in the Torah called the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. So love for God is the most important thing. But then Jesus quickly followed up by saying another command from the Torah was also the most important, to love your neighbor as yourself. So which is the most important, loving God or loving your neighbor? Jesus' answer is yes. To ask the question means you don't get his point. For Jesus, they are two sides of the same coin. Your love for God will be expressed by your love for people and vice versa, they're inseparable. And so this makes it clear that for Jesus, agape love is not primarily a feeling for someone else that happens to you, like our phrase, I fell in love. For Jesus, love is action. It's a choice that you make to seek the well-being of people other than yourself. Jesus also went on to teach that genuine love for God and others means seeking people's well-being without expecting anything in return, especially from people who are in difficult situations who can't repay you even if they wanted to. According to Jesus, this kind of generous love reflects the very heartbeat of God. And he took this even further. Jesus said that the ultimate standard of authentic love is how well you treat the person that you can't stand. Or in his words, you shall love your enemy and do good to them, expecting more nothing in return. For Jesus, this kind of enemy embracing love imitates the very character of God himself. Now we wouldn't be talking about Jesus still today if he had only said things like love your enemy. This is how he actually lived. 
Jesus was constantly helping and serving the people around him in very practical and tangible ways. And he consistently moved towards poor and hurting people who couldn't benefit him in return. He showed love for the forgotten ones, the people who usually fall through the cracks. And when Jesus eventually marched into Jerusalem, he made himself an enemy of the leaders of his people by accusing them of hypocrisy and corruption. But then instead of attacking his enemies to overthrow them, he allowed them to kill him. Jesus died for the selfishness and corruption of his enemies because he loved them. After Easter morning, Jesus and then his followers claimed that it was the power of God's love for the world that was revealed in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. As the Apostle Paul put it, God demonstrated his own agape for us in this. While we were still sinners, the Messiah died for us. Or in the words of the Apostle John, God's own agape was revealed when he sent his one and only son into the world so that through him we could have life. And for John, then, this leads naturally to the conclusion, beloved ones, if that's how God has loved us, then we ought to show love for one another. So Christian faith involves trusting that at the center of the universe is a being overflowing with love for his world, which means that the purpose of human existence is to receive this love that has come to us in Jesus and then to give it back out to others, creating an ecosystem of others-focused, self-giving love. And that's the New Testament meaning of agape love. Our reading today is from 1 John chapter 4 verses 9 to 16. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Good morning. My name's John Marsh, retired vicar, and a member here at so the Holy Trinity. Let's pray as we begin. Father God, as we think about your coming into the world in the person of Jesus, help us to understand the significance of that and make our appropriate response in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been with us for our services during Advent, you'll know that each week we've focused on a particular Advent theme. The first week, we have talked about hope and how much it's needed in our current situation. Then Mike spoke about peace, movingly sharing his experience of a visit to Srebrenica and the site of the 1995 genocide. Last week, Paul helpfully spoke about the importance of joy, even in difficult times. Today, our theme is love. I reckon that of all these four words, love is the one which is spoken about and written about most, but so often emptied of real meaning. It's often used to advertise a whole range of products, from cars to chocolates to clothing and much more besides. And the greeting card makers have a field day with it, particularly at the time of Valentine's Day offering all kinds of sloppy verses about love in equally sloppy cards. But the real thing is very different, as I hope you'll see this morning. In the Greek language in which the New Testament was written, there were several words for love in common usage. In his book, The Four Loves, 
C.S. Lewis discusses, discusses the meaning of some of them. There was storge, which would have been used of love within the family, particularly between parents and children. There was eros, which speaks of erotic love, and might refer to a couple being in love. And there is philia, which is affectionate friendship between people who share common values, interests or activities. It's the root of the word Philadelphia, meaning brotherly love, as well as soft cheese. But there was another word which was apparently little used and whose origins are vague, which the early Christian community adopted to express the very special kind of love they'd encountered through the life and ministry of Jesus. That word is agape or agape. This is selfless, selfless, unconditional love and came to be the word used to speak of true Christian or Christ-like love. Thus, this is the word behind most of the New Testament references to love. It's there, for example, in the two great commandments to love God and love your neighbour. It's prominent in the familiar chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, often read at weddings. It's there in the Gospel, in a nutshell verse, verse John 3, 16. God so loved the world. And it is present in abundance in John's first letter, no less than 16 times in the verses we have just heard read. Clearly, love is of central importance in John's understanding of the Gospel. An emphasis which he no doubt gleaned from his own experience of God's love as he engaged with Jesus in the three years he spent as one of the twelve disciples. This was surely enhanced still further as John stood at the foot of the cross and heard the dying Jesus commend his mother Mary to his care. As a result, when he came to write his version of the life of Jesus, the fourth gospel, he referred six times to the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is usually reckoned to be a coded reference to himself. As a result of this profound personal experience of God's love through Jesus, he has much to teach us. First, the fundamental truth that God is love, that's in verse 16 and also in verse 8. That is the heart of the character of God, that wherever God is, there is love. Of course, there are times when we struggle with this, particularly when we're aware of pain and suffering, either first-hand in ourselves or second-hand in others. But John would urge us to believe that God is always and constantly love. There have been numerous people over the years who've tried to reverse the statement and say, love is God. In other words, wherever love is, God is. But that is not true. Because with the coming of Jesus, the love of God has been definitively and permanently shaped by Jesus. The incarnation, which we celebrate at Christmas, has given us a perfect template for God's love. Second, God has shown us his love very specifically in dealing with our sins. That's verse 9. Or as the message version expresses it, to clear away our sins and the damage they've done to our relationship with God. Paul wrote something similar in his letter to the Romans. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's Romans 5 verse 8. There are those who sometimes say that God couldn't possibly love them because of what they have done, the kind of people they are. But John would say to them, supported by Paul, that it is simply not true. God has done everything in Jesus, cleared away every possible barrier to enable us fully to enjoy God's great love. Third, as a result of this, we can be assured that God's love is a forgiving love 
and he invites us to emulate that in our lives. In the well-known chapter about love, 1 Corinthians 13, there is a striking statement which says, love keeps no record of wrongs. And that is so true of God's love. And it was modelled supremely by Jesus on the cross when hanging in excruciating pain, he looked down on those who banged in the nails and prayed, Father, forgive them. We live in a world where people are forever keeping records of wrongs. That is, hanging on to things that are said and done and not letting go of them. And this always spoils relationships. It happens in international affairs. It happens in local communities. It happens in families. It even happens in churches. But if we take seriously the challenge to love as God has loved us, then we need to hear loud and clear that God's love forgives. And so must ours. Fourth, this wonderful love of God, shaped by Jesus, has been given to us by the Spirit. John simply states in verse 13 that God has given us of his Spirit. But Paul elaborates that on that statement, telling us that God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Romans 5, verse 5. Here is great potential for you and me, for those times when we know we should love but can't. In the parish at Emily, where I was vicar, there was this lovely, saintly, elderly lady, Gladys, who used to say, Lord, I can't love them. You love them through me. This is a wonderful privilege, part of God's promise of love to us, that the self same love that God is, the love which Jesus so clearly demonstrated in his life and ministry, has been poured out into us. Fifth, and here is the challenge. This is where the rubber hits the road, as they say. On the basis of God's love for us, we are challenged no less than three times in this short passage to love one another. And John gives us a very specific and demanding rationale. There are just two places in the New Testament where it is stated that no one has ever seen God. And they're both found in John's writing. The first is in the first chapter of John's Gospel, at verse 18. There, having stated that no one has seen God, John offers this response. The one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. In other words, the incarnation, Jesus coming as the Word become flesh, means that we can see God and know what God is like. As Jesus said to his disciples when they asked him to show them the Father, anyone has seen me has seen the Father. The second time John states that no one has seen God is in our passage today, in verse 12. But John's response is very different. Now, he says, if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. I reckon, John is saying, that if we as a Christian community really get our act together and learn to love one another with the quality of love John has explained, then people will meet God here and see God amongst us. That, my friends, is some challenge. And this challenge has its roots in the Incarnation, which we celebrate at Christmas. As I have reflected, reflected afresh on the familiar themes of Advent and Christmas, I have revisited three familiar statements 
in John's writing. First, in the first chapter of his Gospel, which we often read on Christmas Day or possibly at the midnight service, where John encapsulates the heart of the Christmas event in these familiar words. The Word became flesh, verse 14. The Word was enfleshed in a human person. But earlier, in the same opening section of his Gospel, he has already stated the Word was God. Verse 1. Putting these two statements together, we surely realise that what John is telling us is that in Jesus, God became flesh. God was enfleshed in a human person. And in today's reading, in his first epistle, John takes this one stage further when he states, God is love. So on the basis of these three Johannine statements, what we celebrate at Christmas is love becoming flesh. Love being enfleshed in a human person. Thus, the opening line of the Christmas carol, love came down at Christmas. This is what people experienced during Jesus' public ministry. As they met him, they encountered God's love. Why did Jesus stop and chat to a woman at a well when there were religious, political and moral reasons why he shouldn't? Because God loved her and she experienced that love for herself through Jesus. Why did he stop in the streets of Jericho to minister to a blind beggar when no one else would bother? Because God loved him and he experienced that love for himself through Jesus. Why did he happily go to tea with Zacchaeus and his dodgy friends where most people despise them? Because God loved them and they experienced that love for themselves through Jesus. My friends, I believe passionately that this is exactly what people in our communities need today. To experience God's profound love for them. And how might that happen? When they encounter it enfleshed in human persons, like you and me. I wonder if you saw this amazing BBC news item a couple of weeks ago from Burnley showing desperately needy people receiving help and support from a team of people led by the local churches. Did you hear the desperate pleas from the pastor of the church on the street and from the vicar of St Matthew's? And did you see them both weeping? As I watched, I thought, these dear people in Burnley had caught a glimpse of God's love, not in church, but on their doorstep. Not in words, but in action. In a very real way, love had become flesh for them. That, I suggest, is John's challenge to us this Christmas. That because of God's profound love for us, we take every opportunity to enflesh that love for others I am reminded of those oft-quoted words of St. Teresa of Avila. Christ has no body now, but yours. No hands, no feet on earth, but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks with compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now on earth, but yours. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that when you came in the person of Jesus that first Christmas, love 
was enfleshed for people of those days. How we pray that by your spirit, we today may take your love to other people in our own lives as we reach out to them in love. Help us, we pray, by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much uh, for bringing God's word to us this morning, uh, John. I don't know about you, but my experience is that uh, when I am more intentionally connected to God and connected to the source of love, which is God, uh, and when I know how much I'm loved, then I'm much more instinctive in giving his love away. And I just recognise just how much I need uh, to know God's love for me, to be able to share that love with others. So why don't we just for a short moment, just uh, wait in silence and ask God by his spirit to fill us afresh with his love, ready to share that with those who we will meet tomorrow and this Christmas time. Thank you, Father, that you are the God of love. Thank you for the love you've shown us in your Son. And thank you that by your Spirit you come and impart that love into our lives again. And so we just wait on you for this short moment and we pray, come Holy Spirit, fill our lives with your love. Fill our hearts, just as we saw from Jada and Jasmine, fill our hearts so that we can give your love away to others. Come Holy Spirit, we need your love afresh today. And our response is to lay down our lives, just like Jesus did, in loving other people, in gi giving ourselves back to God. Let's uh, do that in the words of our next song now. I will offer up my life.
true soul of in a king Savior, what can be said? What can be sung? As a praise of your name For the things you have done So we're coming to the end of our service this morning. Uh, it's been great to have you with us. Don't forget uh, to join us this afternoon at four o'clock for the Holy Trinity Christmas gift. We really look forward to seeing you uh, online for that. If you'd appreciate prayer for anything, uh, then don't forget to uh, be aware of the slide that comes up at the end of the service that will show you how to get in touch with us if we can pray with you and for you. And let's just be ready in these days before Christmas to be people of love, ready to give God's love away to those who we come into contact with as we seek to be those who love God and love Huddersfield. Let's finish together uh, as we pray. Now may the love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. May the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. And may the joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Have a great day and we'll see you very soon. Bye for now.